the Church of Philadelphia had a huge open door to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the entire world. Now, there's one important note that I want to say that I hope that you will remember. It's not part of the lesson, but it's a nugget that I've developed. When I study history, it's incredible. There are too many nuggets to dig out from there and what we can learn. But if you recall our previous history lessons, there's not as much excitement compared to Philadelphia. Now, when we came to Philadelphia, you notice that there's like a heart burning and there's a lot of excitement. The reason why is because, note this, the Church of Philadelphia is probably the most active era where you see a Bible-believing group laboring fervently for the Lord while they're being attacked by the wicked one, but they give victory all the time. But in other church eras, you see the Christians apostatizing and Satan's darkness growing throughout the whole world that I could give you history lessons on uh, Dracula, for example, or Alexander the Great, and there's so much as a yawn compared to hearing the Anabaptist Amen. who got burnt at the stake for the Lord. Yeah. Now, what's, what am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that if you live your whole life with success or, you know, world fame, whatever, you can be as famous as uh, Caesar Augustus, who has the entire world empire at his feet, but it's still a yawn and a blink in history compared to these Anabaptists yeah. who suffered and who don't have much fame and died for the Lord. The difference with the Anabaptists compared to other Christians be in the past is they were as more fervent for the Lord. And they received as much attack. Now, you know which time period that uh, is close to that? Laodicea. We are in a time of great excitement where, yes, the world is in apostasy, but we see uh, the Christians uh, fighting against that apostasy. The greater majority of Christians are falling into apostasy, but you see these Bible believers still standing in the gap. Yeah. And fighting against incredible odds. That's why our history is incredible as well. We are living in yeah. exciting times. Amen. If you follow the trend of this world, you will be that little beep in history that is hardly mentioned. But at the judgment seat of Christ, us, when God goes through his world history, it has to be a world history class at the judgment seat of Christ. Do you realize that? And you, are, you and I are going to be that one, uh, one record that's mentioned in the finale of history. It's going to be such an awesome thing. So that's the reason why we have to keep in mind to not follow the trend of the world. No matter how famous you are, you're still a blip to God. And it's just a boring part. Oh, uh, Attila the Hun, so what? You hear uh, all these other famous leaders and it doesn't mean much to you until we come across, you see these Anabaptists, you see the Vaudois, and then we hear about Luther and Wycliffe and Savonarola and Huss, Chrysostom during that time, and then the Syrian Christians and historians. Talk about excitement. Talk about excitement. But Philadelphia is the one that tops compared to all other church eras before because there's more Christians who are fervent, excited. They're not following the apostasy trend. If we were to do that too, then we would also be in the most exciting church era next to Philadelphia. So I want you to keep that in mind. So that's why the history lesson, when I took Dr. Upman's church history class, he would say that you know, the first part is boring, but once we come to church history class too, you'll get excited. The reason why is we're hitting the age of Philadelphia, so we're hearing all these preachers and missionaries that went out for the Lord, which is true. Church history, one, was just, oh, man, you talk about boring, and it was so hard to follow. But there's so much gold, there's so much learning that I should not take for granted, that I should value, but you just can't help it because there's just so much darkness and apostasy. Nothing important there. Nothing important. Until you come to Whitfield and Wesley and these guys and D.L. Moody and then you just can't help but your blood is pumping, pumping strong. Okay, so I want you to keep that in mind. So you are actually in the most exciting part of our history class, believe it or not. We are in Philadelphia. So we are continuing on that trend. You might recall the Moravians, they had a burden to 
go out in missions. So we're continuing on the last part of the Moravian missions, and this will be the final part that I'm going to be covering. The final part of uh, the Moravian missions will be George Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-D-T. George Schmidt had a burden for the people in Africa. So this is the Moravian who actually went all the way down to Africa to try to win these people to Christ. George Schmidt, out of many missionaries, he is one of my most favorites. He is one of my most favorites is George Schmidt. You talk about a missionary who sacrificed much, who labors so hard. You've heard about other Moravian missionaries, how, remember, they're starting from scratch. They're literally starting from scratch, and they had to learn the language by themselves. They had no school or training. They just thrust themselves into the mission field, and uh, some of them made themselves slaves to win other slaves to Christ. And They were hated by their own white peers because of their heart caring for the black populace, I mean, these Moravians, they were something else. It puts you under so much conviction. Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf is a big name. Christian David is a big name. Uh, and then the other names include Hans Ingedi, Leonard Dober. I recommended to you a video called First Fruits. That's a very good video. It's free. You can watch on YouTube. And that will show you the first time through Leonard Dober how missions started to spread out. Now, George Schmidt is one of my... Uh, most favorite missionaries. Schmidt, he actually suffered persecution and he tried not to deny the faith. But remember, he was, during this time, the Jesuits were in control. Jesuits were masters of torture. It was a horrible thing George Schmidt went through. And George Schmidt, he took a stand for Jesus Christ. He would not give in. But finally, after languishing uh, three years in a dungeon cell, then Schmidt, he finally broke down, and with the Jesuits' clever torture tactics, they were able to finally break him, and Schmidt uh, recanted, unfortunately. So he suffered so much and humiliated. When he went back to his brethren, he expected a warm welcome, but the brethren turned him down cold. Now, you talk about utter discouragement after suffering so much torture for Jesus Christ, and that you would expect the brethren would help him, but instead they scolded him for his weakness. So because he was scolded for his weakness, he wanted to prove his worth. So he decided to become a missionary to Africa, and he did prove his worth for the Lord. So instead of being discouraged and forsaking his Christianity like most Christians would do just because of one or two mess-ups, this is a guy who didn't care about being looked down by his own brethren, even after three years of torture, and decided, I'm going to go to Africa wow. and win those souls to Christ. I am reading, this is all based off of the book From Jerusalem to Irian Jaya by Ruth Tucker. It reads here, South Africa was undoubtedly as difficult a mission field as any during the early 18th century. The Dutch colonists did not look favorably on missionary endeavors that might raise the social status of the Africans. And not surprisingly then, Schmidt's arrival among them was viewed with antagonism. Moreover, the Calvinistic Dutch Reformed ministers, it's always, it's always the stinking Calvinists, okay? They always kill everything. I keep telling you that who were in the Cape Colony deplored the emotional and sentimental pietism of the Moravians. Now remember the pietist movement was the one that revived the Lutheran group. If they were stuck with Calvinism, they would have been, die, uh, they would have been dead cold. But the pietist movement was what stirred up the heart and the zeal part. The Moravians were influenced by the pietist movement, as I've told you. So you might recall that, okay? So remember, the pietists movement was what started the heart and the zeal. Moravians were influenced by it, and they actually did the deed by spreading out missions. So remember, those two are the most important group during that time on missions. It's Pietists and Moravians. Continuing on, Schmidt uh, himself did little to endear himself to the Dutch colonists. Uh, according to one account, 
He was definitely a hypocrite and a sham, sometimes climbing on the low roof of the house. There he knelt so that all could see him and pretended to pray. So that's how they mocked him. Why? Because they, they, were, they were cold, dead orth, uh, Orthodox people. That's why. Just like today's Calvinists, no different. They poke fun at you for, you know, singing, shouting, and having zeal for the Lord. Doesn't, doesn't that sound like them? Yeah. Cold, formal bunch. All right. After residing at a military post for a time, Schmidt traveled inland to a region known as Ape Valley to work among the Hottentots. The Hottentots, characterized by their lack of, this is uh, old English writing, so because some terms might be politically incorrect, I'm just going to skip it, okay? So this is an old book. Now, I just hate the modern generation because every two years, there seems to be a new term. And whatever terms we refer to each other is considered racist or politically incorrect. So I can't say it anymore, okay? So I'm just going to bypass this, okay? Their lack of blank features and their small size were regarded as black cattle by the colonists and were hunted down like animals in the colonists' effort to enslave them. So that's, uh, remember, that's uh, the environment of the Dutch or the Dutch Calvinist group. Okay, anyways. They cautiously welcomed Schmidt, and with the help of a Hottentot interpreter, he began preaching to them, and in a very short time, he had established a school with some 50 pupils. As with other Moravian missionaries, Schmidt's ministry was not financed by supporters back home. All Moravians were expected to be evangelists, and there was little differentiation between those who ministered on the home field and those who went abroad. Remember, I told you that the Moravians, which changed my life, and I told you I hope changes this church's life, is literally their marriage decision, their job choices, their living scenarios, and everything that they spent was a focus on how will this contribute to winning souls and helping right. our souls out right. there? That was the center of everything and of what they lived and breathed. That's why these people, they didn't have to go around traveling for uh, deputation because they were already used to a life of working themselves while ministering and yeah. being mission minded. That's why they were able to get away with it, actually. For a time, he worked as a day laborer, butchering, tanning hides, threshing wheat, pruning fruit trees, and doing other farm chores. And after a time, he acquired some livestock of his own as well as his own garden. Life was not easy for Schmidt in South Africa. The winter of 1740 was particularly severe, and he and his neighbors survived a food shortage only by shooting a hippopotamus, an animal not normally used for sustenance. But to Schmidt, matters of day-to-day -day living were secondary. That's right. His sole purpose for being in Africa was evangelism of its people. I wonder if we think like that in this area. You know, like our job is secondary. The primary thing is for souls. Uh, let's see right here. In this area, he, uh, too, he faced hard times and setbacks. His little flock of believers was unstable and given to backsliding. Even Africa, his interpreter, fell back into his old ways. He went on drinking binges with his friends and almost shipwrecked the fledgling little church. Schmidt reacted harshly, and a few days later, the men involved repented, but spiritual lethargy persisted. So discouraged was Schmidt that he wrote to Zinzendorf that he intended to return home. Wow, you talk about discouragement. What happened... Uh, is Schmidt's problems in building a sound fellowship of Christians were not only with the Africans, but also with the Dutch residents and colonial authorities. Yeah, no su surprise. Local farmers maliciously besmirched his reputation, some charging that he was living with a hot and taut woman, others claiming that he was a spy. Now remember, this is saved uh -huh. Calvinist yeah. brethren. Who makes up these accusations, no different from today with your uh, sly little comments and posts that you do online. And the colonial authorities, both religious and secular, deeply resented his continuing presence. The presence of an unordained laborer who had the audacity of assuming a position of spiritual leadership. Because <laughs> right, you didn't graduate from theological seminary like I did. Yeah. 
then when I rub dirt on them of what university I graduated from, which is better than theirs, then they're like, you're so arrogant. Yeah. You just want me be like you. I refuse to be like you, okay? Now, you know what Zinzendorf did? Remember that everybody discouraged him. So he wrote a letter to Zinzendorf and he intended to return home. But Zinzendorf wrote a letter to Schmidt. He gave advice saying, uh, outline mission policy. And at the same time, you know what he did? He ordained him. And he also said, why don't you baptize the children of the Hottentots who die in, uh, let's see, who die in infancy. Presumably he meant before they died. He who comes with water and blood has died for them too. I ordain you for the case of a baptism or a communion, a minister of our church in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. I am very pleased with you, but my dear, you aim too much at the skin of the Hottentots and too little at the heart. You must tell the Hottentots, especially their children, the story of the Son of God. If they feel something, pray with them. If not, pray for them. If feeling persists, baptize them where you shot your hippo. So the hippopotamus. Receiving ordin So end of quote. Receiving ordination was a great encouragement to Schmidt. And he immediately exercised his rights to administer the sacraments by baptizing Wilhelm, who had been his first Hottentot convert. Soon others were baptized and word spread to, spread to Dutch officials of what was happening. Rather than calming the situation, Schmidt's ordination only intensified the animosity of the Dutch officials toward him. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Reform ministers at Cape Town insisted that the baptisms were invalid. They summoned two of the converts to come before them to undergo the standard catechism instruction and were surprised to find them as knowledgeable of doctrine as some of their own candidates for baptism. Yeah. Oh, wow. Nevertheless, Schmidt was ordered to leave South Africa and face officials back in Holland. Thus, in the spring of 1744, he sailed for Europe to argue the validity of his ministry before the Dutch authorities there. Despite the efforts of Schmidt and other Moravian leaders, permission to return was never granted. Now, these are your saved pious, educated, the, uh, seminary from Calvin School, yeah, yeah. Dutch Reformed idiots. Yeah. And the little church among the Hottentots remained without a shepherd for nearly half a century until 1792. Now that's real wicked. These are supposedly Christians. Christians, man. Christian, my foot, man. They just damn souls to hell. So what happened? It was in that year that Moravians returned to the valley. And to their amazement, they found an old woman whom Schmidt had baptized more than 50 years before, still cherishing the New Testament he had given her. That's Schmidt's fruit, man. He was, he was tortured, criticized by fellow brethren, unordained. And then his, uh, the Dutch reform looked down on him. He was all alone. He had a backsliding little fledgling church. And then he even got kicked out after that. Wow. But the Lord uh, gave him fruit right there. Yeah. He used him. The, the second missionary endeavor in the Cape Colony by the Moravians was far more successful than the first. Under the capable direction of Hans Halbeck, the mission work thrived. And by the mid-20th century, there were 38 stations and nearly 50,000 professing Christians under Moravian jurisdiction. So that talked about plowing. He plowed it. And then they were able to reap the fruits. Now, I wished I combined Schmidt's uh, story with Hans and Getty, Christian David, and Zinzendorf and Leonard Dober, that would have been great, uh, but uh, I wasn't able to finish off that. Uh, if you were to listen to my previous discipleship video, I'd encourage you to watch that one about Moravian missions. It's incredibly, incredibly life-changing. Okay, now let's come to, let's look at an overall thing. So while missions are going around, let's come over here. Remember, what uh, Luther did just uh, really broke up the Roman Catholic Empire. 
it just started to spread. And then it started to now invade inside uh, schools, politics, uh, and everyday life and economics and nations and governments. What Luther did just uh, broke the Roman Catholic Empire. England, with the freedom, with the King James Bible, and people now having access to the scriptures, it was being poisoned now. So the Catholic Empire is breaking apart. Now, what you want to see right here, let's go through fresh review. Go to Genesis 10. Genesis chapter 9, excuse me, Genesis 9. If you recall, when God gave the blessing to one of Noah's sons, the blessing was as follows, which was fulfilled later on in history. We are now in that time of Philadelphia. It was fulfilled. Genesis 9, 27. Genesis 9, 27. The Bible says, God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So you'll notice right here that Japheth is spreading out Recall this, the Catholic Empire was spreading out and sending people to the New World. Do you remember that one? I've explained that in, a long, in 2021, last year, in the discipleship classes. So the Roman Catholic Empire here is, spread, is sending out explorers to North America, South America, and then obviously Canada, USA. So they're increasing. If you recall Philip of Spain with this, fa uh, with this famous Spanish armada, he had territory over here too. So he was the world's most powerful emperor. There was no way the King James Bible would be able to be uh, published, but God just totally wrecked his empire. So Spain now lost its uh, number one status as world empire because of what God did. He trashed it. So the Catholics and Jesuits were just getting spanked and spanked and spanked. Mm -hmm. But they were spreading out throughout all the world, you might recall. So we read about George Schmidt. And then you're going to see later on they were spreading out here and here. I mean, they were spreading out everywhere. The Jesuits reached as far as over here, you might recall. What's going on over here? What's going on is Shem, so I explained in my previous discipleship class, so I'm not going to really cover it here, but even Basic Sociology 101 calls it uh, Mongoloid, Negroid, and uh, Caucasian, but now that's not an accurate term anymore now, so they just keep changing as the world goes. <laughs> Scientists never get it right, by the way, okay? They'll give you a term now, but trust me, trust me, yeah, they'll change it again, all right? They'll be wrong. How trustworthy is our science today compared to the Bible? And they want you to trust science more than the Bible? How laughable these people. Right. Anyways, so Japheth, which is covering that uh, Caucasian or so-called Caucasian side, they are dwelling in the tents of Shem. So the Shemites are that Mongoloid side. In the previous discipleship class, I've explained to you how they were spreading out. They were crossing from, after the Tower of Babel, the Shemites or the Mongoloid, they were going through here, then to here, and then down to North America, down here, where we got the Native Americans. And then I explained to you also uh, that it is possible that they could have sent out ships to down here. And it's interesting, Phoenician coins were found here, and Phoenicia is a part of that land of Canaan that the Israelites were conquering. So there are sons of God activity that fled over there. And I've explained that in our last discipleship class. But I've told you that that sons of God activity is diminishing as the Caucasian or Japhus seed is spreading out and reaching over there. So as they're reaching out, the devil is uh, letting go of paganism because now he's replacing it with civilized paganism, if you want to call it. Or Catholicism, right? Let's just call it Catholicism. So the devil is able to let go his paws. So Catholic territory is spreading out here and everywhere. Now, think about this. Do you realize how dangerous that is? You could summon the Antichrist and the New World Order and the Tribulation with Babylon. 
But what happened was is that the Bible believers just broke this system apart, so now it's mingling up with Protestant states. However, you might recall, even though Luther broke apart the Catholic Empire, the problem is, is Calvin's system really killed everything. So then Calvin's system killed everything, so then the Protestant states came out with dead cold formalism. So then you have a mixture of, so it's, the idea is like this. I'm going to color this, that way you can I, understand here, okay? So let's assume this red part is where you're fired up for the Lord, okay? So this is where the Bible believers are at. The blue part is the cold part of the Christians, Calvinism. The purple is dead on heresy, Catholicism. What you'll notice with the people, the good guys are either here or here, okay? The bad guys are either here or here or here, okay? Now, if you notice throughout our church history classes, We've seen some of the people like right over here. Uh, one example is like Luther, right? Yeah. And then we see right here the English uh, reformers or Knox. Over here we got the uh, Anabaptists, Moravians. And then over here... You got Calvin. That's, that's, that's like no room. <laughs> so I'll just put it here. And I have to cover a lot tonight, so let's see how it goes. Okay. Or either here. It doesn't matter. All right. And then the Catholics are over there, which we already know. So the Jesuits. We'll put Jesuits here. They're over here. Okay, uh, let me move toward this side. That way people could see if they can see. So if we look at these three colors, Anabaptists are in this red zone. In between the red and blue, Luther, Knox, and then in the blue zone, we get Calvin. And then the purple zone is the Jesuits. Okay, we follow so far, right? So that's the idea. That's the idea. That's what you're going to notice throughout uh, the church history or the Philadelphia era. Understanding the context of this, so we see a lot of Catholic territory and Protestant states. So that's uh, blue and purple, that means, okay? So either you get cold Christians or you get heretical Catholics. That's what's going on now yeah. throughout the empire. So throughout the empire, that's what's going on. Think about, like I told you, the Catholic Church could have had its paws everywhere. If it weren't for Luther, then the Catholics would have had all the territory. But now it's mingled up with Protestant states, okay? If the Protestant states, which is the blue, cover some parts in America or in these territories, who's going to follow the blue then? The red. That's how the Moravians got in, for example. And that's why they're going to get over here too. That's how Bible believers were able to carry on the gospel. So that's what you're going to see this trend throughout history. So what you're going to see throughout history as Japheth is living in the tents of Shem and then Ham, we see that's the third part in the sociology part, the Negroid, will be his servant. We see that prophecy fulfilled with Japheth dwelling in the tents of Shem and Canaan being the servant. This is that time period. This is that time period. It was intended to be a blessing to Japheth, but like I taught you before in previous Genesis studies or in my discipleship class, whether you get a blessing or, or a curse, you can either use it well or use it poorly. Yeah. And uh, if everyone has a human nature, let's be honest, yeah. everybody uses their blessing poorly. Yeah. Yeah. So Japheth obviously used it poorly where Satan uh, contaminated within it, but there were some from Japheth's line who used it well. They used it well where God, uh, God shall enlarge Japheth, where Bible believers followed along that path to spread the gospel. Amen. So that's what's going on. Now, if we were to 
go throughout this time period. It's a very, it's a very chaotic time period. So remember, Japheth is all over the territory. Protestant states and the Catholic Holy Roman Empire is battling with each other. Now, because Spain lost its power, there was a country who's uh, growing in power, and that's France with the Bourbon dynasty. So what's going on is you're seeing three categories during this timeline. France with this Bourbon dynasty. The Habsburg dynasty is where the Holy Roman Empire is based off of now. Okay, The Holy Roman Empire is based off the Habsburg dynasty, and then you got the broken Protestant states. So you get these three. And then what you get is the Great Awakening Revival. No, obviously, if you get blue and purple clashing, you get nothing but war and, you know, getting involved in politics and all this kind of stuff, kind of like today. Yeah, Okay? While Bible believers are busy spreading the gospel. Yeah. While you're all fighting each other. Okay. It's called the 30 Years' War. So the 30 Years' War, it broke up into these following timelines. I'm going to read a lot over here, so follow along with me. I'm going to be reading some big names as well. This is from Frederick Widdowson's book, page 292. The political events of this era between 1600 and 1800 were chaotic and complicated. The Thirty Years' War started as a religious war between Catholics and Protestants in Germany. Eventually, it also became a struggle by the Habsburg dynasty of the Holy Roman Empire trying to gobble up as much of Europe as possible in opposition to France's Bourbon dynasty and Protestant states. All right, we're following so far, right? Okay. On the, Catholic, uh, on the Catholic Habsburg side were the following countries. Austria, most of the German Catholic princes, and Spain. Well, obviously Spain, right? No surprise. Opposing them were the Protestant princes of Germany, the Protestant kingdoms of Denmark and Sweden, Yay, Max, okay. And Catholic France, okay? Oh, he's not here, all right. <laughs> so France, even though it's Catholic, it's going against the Holy Roman Empire. If you recall in our uh, discipleship classes, you'll notice that it doesn't matter if you're a Catholic nation. Sometimes you just get drunk on power. And then some sometimes the kings and queens will fight the popes, and then the kings and queens who are Catholic will fight against each other. You know what they are? They, they, they really are not based off of brotherly love or real Christianity. It's all power. It's all drunk on power using religion as a means for it. Anyways, as war raged across Europe from Poland to the Netherlands, the population was devastated and not since the Mongol invasion. So ever since Genghis Khan with the Mongols, remember when they were conquering Europe and, and slaughtering people? Never since... Genghis Khan, did they have that much slaughter? Wow. And they were killing each other off. Wow. Ain't that something? 30 years. <laughs> Excuse me. So known as the 30 Years' War. 1608, the Protestant princes of Germany, led by Frederick IV, the Elector Palatine, and Christian of Anhalt, combined in protest to form the Evangelical Union against the occupation by Maximilian of Bavaria, of the free city of Donauworth. So Maximilian retaliated. He created his own league. It's a Catholic league along with other Catholic princes in 1609. Then we start the first phase. 16, uh, in 1609, King Rudolf of Bohemia declared religious freedom for his Protestant subjects, protected by a body of men known as the Defenders. As a result, he was deposed by his brother Matthias in 1611, and the freedom was reversed. In 1612, Matthias was elected Holy Roman Emperor, so he switched to Catholic. In 1617, because he was childless, his counselors elected Archduke Ferdinand of Styria as heir, but he was faced with the refusal to be recognized by Protestant, led by Matthias III. On May 22, 1618, two of the king's most trusted counselors were thrown from the windows of the castle Hrotschen in what is called the Defenestration of Prague, which led to open rebellion. Thus it began. The Thirty Years' War started with a Bohemian period between 1618 and 1625, ending with the Siege of Breda, the year after 
Cardinal, I might butcher his name, Richelieu of France brought his country into the war. Richelieu, the king's chief minister from 1622 to 1642, is also famous in history for promoting the idea that religion was a means of promoting the interest of the state. Of the state. Now, Cardinal Richelieu is a big name throughout the Thirty Years' War. He was the one that was heavily involved with all the conflict and warfare and what's going on. As centers of power moved, the next period of the Thirty Years' War between 1625 and 1629 was called the Danish period. So now we're here, the second part. After Christian IV of Denmark invaded Germany, this period lasted until 1629 when Cardinal Richelieu arranged a truce between Poland and Sweden, allowing Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden to enter the fray in Germany. Gustavus Adolphus is a very famous man, actually, who was involved in this. The Swedish period, now we're in Swedish, Gustavus Adolphus, and then it transitions on to the Swedish. The Swedes get involved. Involved from 1630 until 1634. As the Protestant forces fought against the Catholic forces under Count Albrecht von Wallenstein, victory seesawed between the forces ravaging Germany. Then what happened? It transitioned to the French period. It started in 1634 when Catholic Cardinal Richelieu assumed control of the Protestant forces due to the war going badly for them. After Richelieu and Louis XIII died in 1642, and 1643 respectively, a Spanish imperial army invaded France but was repulsed. This war was finally ended by the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, which gave France Alsace and Lorraine through the Treaty of Munster. Let's see. Sweden, Denmark, German Protestants signed Treaty of Os Osnabrück as well. And then it gave some kind of equality within the empire of Catholic and Protestant states. France, Spain, they continued to fight it off, all right? Catholics against Catholics. Now, 1680, France under Louis XIV. Okay, so we come across these four. Now we're entering here. Okay, this is the big thing you want to hear about. This was a significant time period for 30 years' war was attempting to secure a, a uh, uh, he, he was attempting to secure dominance of one state over others over the continent of Europe, Louis XIV. Its population of 19 million was three times that of England or Spain and its army. Organized under Minister of War, Lavoise, was the strongest in Europe. So because France is like three times the size of Spain and England, that's why they become the power dominance which is why you can see a later person named Napoleon Bonaparte was able to become a terror because France was becoming very powerful. Okay, continuing on here, the French Navy was the most powerful in the Mediterranean Sea. Thanks to God who wrecked the Spanish Armada. So now the French is the most powerful. France's economy was not dependent upon foreign colonies like the Dutch, the Netherlands, and the English. This time, the Protestant princes of Germany allied themselves. This is an important name, William of Orange of Holland. Okay, so let's go over here. This is an important name that has to have connections and ties with England and Protestants, William of Orange. He's known as one of those good guys, government leaders. Against Louis, uh, let's see... Princes of Germany allied themselves with William of Orange of Holland against Louis as his supporters were also attempting to overthrow James II of England. So we're going to come back over there. So what's going on? What does this have to do with England? Let's rewind, okay? Then we'll uh, come to this last part of the Thirty Years' War. Uh, this might be blocking it, but I'll show you later, okay? So let's go back to England. Remember, rewind in our discipleship classes, William the Conqueror. Remember him? So William the Conqueror came, came and took over England. And this is based off of page uh, 293 and 294 from Widowson's work. If you uh, read those two pages, it goes from William the Conqueror. He was an absolute monarch. OK, so it was an absolute monarchy. Then we go down as it developed into parliament. 
So that's the reason why we even have parliament today. So this was very important. It was breaking apart into parliament and by the reign of Edward III in the 1300s, which is 14th century, the parliament had formed two houses, one for the upper nobility and higher clergy, and one for knights and lower knights and freemen of a borough or small political division. Then what happened was there was constant tension between parliament and the king for a time. There were civil wars that happened, which is not a surprise. You might recall that if we go over here, we get uh, William Wallace and then Scotland, Ireland, all getting involved. Today, the, uh, let's see, then as it goes from civil wars, we get down to James I of England, known also as James VI of Scotland. Remember, he's the guy who, oversee, uh, who oversaw history's greatest book, the King James Bible. So from there, he made peace with Spain and he also unified Britain. When he unified Britain, because remember, he had rulership in Scotland as well. He's James VI of Scotland, okay, and uh, James I of England. He participated in the Thirty Years' War on a very small scale, so he only got involved very, uh, very little. And it actually ended up in disaster uh, where he had uh, hostilities with Spain. His son Charles I, so now we jump to Charles I here, reigned from 1625 to 1649. He sent an expedition to fight for French Huguenots besieged by Cardinal Richelieu. Now you might recall that, right? The French Huguenots, they were slaughtered over there. So then Charles sent out help and Cardinal Richelieu, he's just as demon possessed as the other Catholics. So that guy's a famous evil name, actually, that cardinal. Which kind of might explain why in like the Three Musketeers, for example, that uh, book, they put a cardinal as a very evil figure. So there's a reason behind that. It has, it's tied to its history. It has, uh, it has much ties to its history. It might have something to do with Cardinal Richelieu, with his connections and powers in the Thirty Years' War and France. Anyway, continuing on here, uh, let's see here, yada, 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 yada. It led to an Anglo-France war between 1626 and 1630 when he was going out to help the French Huguenots. 1628, Parliament issued the Petition of Right asserting grievances such as protest against royal taxation without parliamentary assent. Now what happens is when they were uh, writing out this list of grievances, let's continue on, in 1641 there was a slaughter in Ireland and the Irish War which was a prelude to the Great Rebellion. Why? Because Charles desperately needed money to pursue the war. Puritans, dissidents in Parliament, in an attempt to resist the formation of a standing army, compiled a list of grievances called the Grand Remonstrance. If you recall, the Puritans were uh, involved with uh, King James when King James wanted to publish the King James Bible. The Puritans, we will come to them later, but they are like an in-between, okay? They're like in-between with blue and red, if not almost blue, okay? And I'm going to explain soon, okay, when we come to America. So, uh, so this is a, I'm trying to tie all yeah, this history on, together, okay, in a very more simplified, exciting format. <laughs> if I read it in a historical form, you all be bored, you know, and say, what's the importance? It is very important. All of this is tied together. It ties to what I told you, Genesis 9. So you're seeing Genesis 9 in play and how God is going to carry the Bible believers from these three red lines is something else, okay? Not three red lines, these three colors is something else. All right, so I'm going to show you the dynamics and how it worked out, okay? So just bear along with me, all right? Keep all this swimming in your head, okay? All right, so then the Puritans, they wrote out a list of grievances. So England is having its chaos. So remember, the Protestant states... And the Catholics are having their chaos in Europe. England is having its chaos. If you recall my previous discipleship classes, I paid attention to only two places for Bible-believing lines. I've concentrated Europe and England separately for a reason. Okay? Pretty soon, that's going to fade away. I'm about to hit the place that you're all waiting for. Okay? So the Holy Spirit's moving here. Okay? 
And all of this is tied to what England is about to do. Because remember, God's moving from Europe to England. And then from England to... Okay, I'm going to show you how this transitions. So follow along with me. Okay? So remember, England, uh, it's, it's being affected with its cold formalism a bit. It's being affected with this cold formalism with the Puritans and then the Anglican Church especially, the Anglican Church. There's a group that's sick and tired of all this mess because everyone's involved with government and politics here. But there's a group out there who just wants to spread the gospel and then who just want to spiritually grow and plant churches. So we've seen the Anabaptists, the Moravians, the Pietists doing something, and one important group that's going to get away from all this and go over there. And they started something. We'll get to that group of people soon. Let's get to the last leg of England, though, okay? What's going on? The last chance of England. The last chance of England with their list of grievances to, par uh, to Parliament was Oliver Cromwell, the last most famous guy you want to hear, okay? Oliver Cromwell is a very big name. If you read his life, there is no doubt that this guy, he really treasured the Lord. I believe that he is a saved man because uh, I read a little bit of his testimony. If he's lost, he's lost. But from what I read, it looked like there was a time that he thought about redemption and forgiveness based on uh, Christ. Oliver Cromwell, you'll hear a lot of trash talk against him, okay? That he was a, a rude man, he was evil, and etc. But even if you read Britannica online, the article actually gives a fair article about him. And they said he's not as mean as you think. The only people that treat him as mean is because it's either an extreme liberal or a Catholic. Why? Because they hated this guy. Oliver Cromwell, he was using military might. So just think about... Uh, the previous president, for example, the way he did things, and you will get a bunch of uh, left-wingers extremely mad. Yeah. See, Oliver Cromwell had that kind of mentality, see? So he built up uh, the government or the kingdom that way. So Oliver Cromwell was a very brilliant man. Uh, most of what I'm going to tell you is based on a mixture of Widowson's work as well as Britannica Online, okay? So Oliver Cromwell, he had a, a empathy toward his military soldiers. He wanted uh, military soldiers to take care of parliament itself because he couldn't tr trust those stuffy guys over there. But then uh, it, when I read his life, it's, very, it's a repetition of current events, okay? But then, there were, uh, but then he didn't like certain generals or military people there because they were too lazy or too slow. They were compromising in between. So Oliver Cromwell used all of his might to have somebody else involved, and he was like... Uh, he was heavily, is my clock right? Yes. 8.53. Oh, 8.53. Okay. All right. Oh, my goodness. It almost said 10. I'm like, no, that's not right. Okay. <laughs> I was like, no, that's wrong. I was like, I did not go. That. Okay. All right. 53. Okay. <laughs> All right. I still have time. Okay. Amen. So Oliver Cromwell, he was stamping it all out. Uh, his military reforms created the new model army consisting of professional soldiers led by veteran ge generals and known for their Puritan religious zeal. Uh, what happened in the end, Cromwell was able to make a lot of reforms. And then the monarchy was restored in 1660 with Charles II. The period in between saw the parliament even at odds with the new army and a maritime or sea war between the British and the Dutch then with the rule of James II came Protestant unrest over his attempts to restore Catholicism to equality. So it went from Oliver Cromwell, then James II with uh, the monarchy, and then the tensions with Protestant Catholicism, so William of Orange got involved, okay? So now we return back to the Thirty Years' War. We go to the War of Grand Alliance, okay? In this war of Grand Alliance, it says right here, uh, let's see. I read to you before, the princes of Germany allied, the, allied themselves with William of Orange of Holland against Louis, as uh, remember France, as his supporters were also attempting to overthrow James II of England. Okay, so now we reach that time period. Uh, continuing on, let's see right here. Yada, yada, yada. Louis revoked the Edict of Nantes, uh, 
which promised tolerance to Protestants. So it was obviously easy to create a Protestant alliance against the Catholics. It was called the League of Augsburg. Revolution uh, resulted. William of Orange ended up on the throne, and that was the ensuing war that time. So that's what's going on everything over there. What a mess. Okay, and I have to read this part, okay? Oh, yikes, okay. I have to read this part. I cannot cover this all in five minutes. They have to be tied together. Okay, what I'm going to do is this, okay. I'm going to read this uh, next page in Widdowson's work. This is page 301. Now, okay, you see what's going on. It's a mess, okay? It's a total mess ever since Luther, you, and then you see that it's all politics, government, and fighting, okay? You give it a hundred years, mankind always apostatizes somewhere. So, the Lord is saying, well, the King James Bible's out, they got freedom, and praise the Lord that uh, some anti-Catholic ideology is spreading, but it's a cold formalism. So I need to spread my gospel. Now, what's going on is this. Remember, it's the Anglican Church, not Catholic, because King Henry VIII broke off from the Catholic Empire. What's the difference with Anglican Church and Catholic? Pretty much the same, you know, it's not much different. But then the Puritans were the ones that were uh, mingled with Calvinism, see? So with that Calvinism, they're like in-betweeners. So they're like, okay, let's work out something with the Anglican Church, but we can somehow carry on some kind of Bible-believing ideology, so to speak, or some sort of Christian ideology. Well, that doesn't really fare with them. So then you get these Bible believers, and these Bible believers know what they should be doing. No, we're not compromising. We're not involved in politics and stuff like that. We're separating from them. They became known as the separatists. So the separatists separated themselves uh, from that apostate church, because they know that you can't make compromises. But today's Calvinists, not much different, right? Or apostate Christians, they're always compromising. As Bible believers, we don't get involved in that. Anabaptists were never involved in anything, actually. They were just uh, planting churches and then trying to win souls out there. Moravians were doing that. Pietists were doing that. And then the cold Christians, apostates and Calvinists were pointing fingers because they had no fruit themselves because they were so busy with politics and governments and all that kind of nonsense. Okay? Anyways, going back to the separatists, they were, uh, this is based off of uh, what I highly recommend, okay? It's called American History from a Biblical Perspective by Richard Sowell, yeah. by Rick Sowell. I would highly recommend listening to that one. A lot of the stuff that I'm going to give to you is mingled. I mingled a bunch of stuff together, okay? So I mingle all this together so that I can give you this story, all right? So the separatists, they were, remember, the Netherlands, the Dutch area seemed to be a more safe place. William of Orange, right? That seemed to be more of a safe, more Christian area. But what happened is that, no, it wasn't Christian. It was very worldly and wicked. So much for a Christian nation, like America, right? It's not a Christian nation, but there's so much worldliness and wickedness. You just want to move out of California. Okay, but back to the main point, the separatists could not live any longer there. And they were actually being persecuted. Because why? They were, uh, they're not part of the Dutch heritage. From England, they went to Netherlands, and where they can find solace, they were persecuted, and they were worried about their next generation becoming worldly. Right. Yeah. Now, you can see that they had a Bible-believing mentality. Yeah. All right, they had a Bible-believing mentality. At the same time, you know what was going on? The Catholics and the dead Protestants, they were all invading all over here. And the Native Americans were being exposed by them and they were being slaughtered because these heartless, uh, wicked people based off of Catholics and dead Protestants were slaughtering the Native Americans, ruining their testimony. You gotta realize this. America, before it became a great nation, you have to realize this, it could have been a much worse. But it became great because it started great. How did it start great? 
because a group of separatists who became pilgrims shipped over here and they arrived at a place where they, it was impossible to survive, where Native Americans hated them, actually, because of the previous dead cold Protestants, as well as the Catholics who slaughtered them. But for some weird reason, not a single dead cold Protestant or Catholic ship ever landed at the Plymouth where the pilgrims landed. And the pilgrims were at a place where the Native Americans could have slaughtered and killed them, but they never did. What are the odds, man? The, uh, when you hear about the French exploration right here, it's for some weird reason they didn't go down. Yeah. And for the Spaniards, the Catholics, they never went up. Yeah. And the English who started out their dead Calvinists, yeah. they kept losing their civilization. Uh -huh. And as a matter of fact, even the dark elites, you know, the globalists, yeah. through Sir Francis Bacon, uh, Bacon with Sir Walter Raleigh, based off of William Grady's book, How Satan Turned America Against God, they could have started something. The Lord never blessed it. That's right. wow. So the globalists could have started something, but they never did. The pilgrims were the ones that succeeded. Amen. All next discipleship oh, class. I'm going to combine all of this together. Yeah. It's going to blow your minds, okay? Now, all right then. <laughs> Okay, see you next Wednesday, all right? Let the excitement begin of this story. It's incredible, I'm telling you. Father God, I pray tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. Help us to never forget our history, Lord, where we come from. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.